Coming up on this edition of the Sting Race Show, we are going to be catching up with ESPN senior writer and reporter Chris Lowe to get his take on the future of the SEC and college football. Guys, we've got a lot to cover, so let's get the Sting Race Show rocking and rolling. Hi, this is Tim Brando with a reminder. Those of you on Tide 100.9, Look out, you're about to feel the buzz of Stingray. This is Stephen Ray, a.k.a. Stingray, coming to you live from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I'm Heath Hopkins. I'm here in DeSoto County, Mississippi, right outside of Memphis, Tennessee. You know, Mark, I, I'm going to put you on the spot. Do you feel that responsibility to pay it forward and give some kid a chance coming up in the ranks, kind of like Tony did for you? Why you think I'm talking to Stingray tonight? <laughs> Thank you, man. I appreciate that. No, I mean, it's look, no. Hey, Stingray, here's the deal. When you get involved with Texas, it's like getting married to a stripper. (laughs) And and let me explain this. It looks good, kind of sexy on on the surface, yeah. But then you get the baggage, you get the drama, you get all that eventually comes with it. And that's what you get with Texas, and that's what the Big 12 learned. And Heath, any thoughts on our show moving forward? Hey, to everyone in Tuscaloosa listening here on Tide 100.9, with the Stingray Show, if you don't like it, you better learn to love it, because it's the best show going today, baby. Woo! All right, guys, we are recording. We're all three here. All right. Sounds wonderful. So, Chris, how are things with you? I'm doing great. It's good to be with you guys. Thank you. So, where are you headed for an interview, man? Well, I'm doing something on, um, actually, uh, doing something on Tennessee's defense leading into the Alabama game. Just sort of how it's been a little bit different than maybe people have expected under Josh Heupel, where they've been so good on offense, and now it's sort of the defense that's carrying the torch to this team if uh, if the Vols are indeed going to make a playoff run. Yes. Mm-hmm. Chris, after Bama lost to Vanderbilt and later that night, Tennessee lost to Arkansas there in uh, Fayetteville, the very first thing that went through my mind is the third Saturday in October is now an elimination game. Do you feel the same way or do you think there's still a path for one of these teams that, you know, hey, if they finish out strong and, and, and went out, even if they lose the third Saturday in October, that he could still make the playoff because I feel like mm, you put yourself outside the circle there. Well, yeah, you're certainly on the outside looking in. I agree with that because you already have two losses with still a good portion of the last half season to play. And both teams have tough games remaining. You know, Bama's got to play at LSU. Tennessee's got to play at Georgia. Tennessee's got to play at Vanderbilt. Yeah. Uh, uh, Bama still has Auburn. We all know anything can happen in that game. So, I think the odds would suggest that the loser of this game, yes, will have a very, very difficult time making the playoffs. So, Chris, how surprised are you, speaking of Auburn, of the struggles of Hugh Freeze with Auburn this season? Well, probably no more surprised than he is. I know, speaking with Hugh before the season, he thought they would be a lot better on offense. And... I know there's been a lot made of the quarterback, and you know, I guess we'd all like to have do-overs in life, and certainly I think they would have gone out and found a way to get a quarterback to the portal, and, and they looked. I mean, they were involved with Cam Ward, and I think with the price got to the point to where he wanted to spread the money out more among different positions, and that's cost them because they just haven't played very well at that position. They turned the ball over. There are some younger players on that team, and I think if you want to look for good things, at Auburn, there's some younger guys that are producing, and they're bringing in one of the top classes in the country. But as we know, patience in the SEC and certainly at Auburn is not long. And to have this kind of season in year two, then you go into a year three that sort of becomes Armageddon, you know, it's not ideal for anybody. And, and you look around the league, too, and there have been situations where coaches have had success in year two. You go all the way back to when Kirby was at Georgia. They go to the national championship in year two. Josh Heupel in his second year at Tennessee wins 11 games and they win the Orange Bowl. You know, Lane Kiffin in year two at Ole Miss, I think they win 10 games and and go to a big bowl. So a lot of those things, fair or unfair, are probably working against you, Freeze, right now. But, again, I think you 
when you when you assess a program early in a coach's career, and we're a year and a half into Hughes' tenure there, I think the most important thing is how are they recruiting? Are they are they bringing in guys that you can win with, and guys that you're beating other teams on the recruiting trail for that you got to beat on the field? And they've been doing that. So now it's I think two things: find a way to show some improvement as this year goes on. And then next year, really have that translate onto the field and be a good competitive football team that goes into November, at least in the hunt, you know, to make the playoff. So, Chris, I want to go back to last week just for a second. I believe it was on Thursday. The Big Ten and the SEC both met. What was your biggest takeaway from that meeting of the Big Ten and the SEC? More a show of force, not a show of force, but a show of, all right, we're serious about as the playoff continues to evolve and college football continues to evolve, that we want a bigger piece of the pie, guaranteed piece, when we start expanding this thing. Because it's going to go to 14 teams. There's, There's no doubt in my mind, at least 14 and maybe 16, and the SEC and the Big Ten want to make sure that they're going to get so many spots, so many guaranteed spots, whether it's three or four, in expanded playoff. I mean, is that necessary? I don't know. We could sit and debate that all day. I think in just about every year they're going to get at least three spots, both conferences. I'd be shocked if the SEC doesn't get four this year. But I think that's what that was, and you know, again, it's going to change a ton that the sport is over the next two to three years. Not just the playoff, but as we go into revenue sharing, what that model truly looks like is is, is there a collecting collective bargain agreement model that we sort of go to where the players become employees? But I think the SEC and the, and the SEC clearly see that their way out front, they want to be the ones driving the train. You know, some of these decisions are made. Because they're the ones, they're you know, their schools, the marquee schools, the ones that are generating much of the interest. Uh, the TV people that are watching games on TV, you know, are watching Ohio State and Alabama and Georgia and, and those those type of schools, Michigan. So they want to make sure that that as the as the money is divvied up, you know, and the playoff spots are divvied up, that they get what they feel like is their rightful share. Chris. All right, staying with that, the college football playoff, what leverage, and I know SEC and, and the Big Ten have a lot of leverage, so they're the two biggest boys in the room, but when it comes to the TV and this market, you know, just the underdog in me and, and you know, the, the Patriot in me, hey, let's put the teams that deserve it the most. What if the, the TV guys are like, nope, we're putting in the 16 best teams. We'll guarantee the conference champions and give them a buy. Well, for 16, we probably won't do buys, but, uh, you know, we'll guarantee it. What, what footing and leverage does the SEC and Big Ten have in that negotiation? Go play their own playoff. Okay. I mean, I think that would be one. And I know that I don't think they really want to do that, but I think that's certainly something they don't mind dangling out there. You know, when you start talking about leverage, you've got what uh, eighteen, sixteen, so you got what thirty-two teams, and mm-hmm. I think most of your teams are are in that are in those two conferences that generate most of the uh, you know mo- most of the the pop around college football. No, not every not every one of them. You got Notre Dame certainly, and I think there's some teams in the ACC that that generates a lot of interest, and even. When you get into the Big 12, but the way the, the 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 sport has been reshaped, with a lot of the power conferences on the West Coast moving to the Big Ten, Oklahoma and Texas moving to the SEC. I mean, they've got the goods right now. Yeah, I think that would be one thing. And you know what? I would say a playoff, a 12-team playoff, a 14-team playoff among the Big Ten and the SEC would lead to a massive TV contract deal. I mean, think about it. You got, yeah, you got fourteen teams playing. You know, the first round is is, is Texas um, versus Ole Miss. You know, Georgia versus, um, or I say Texas or Texas versus um, Michigan. Georgia versus Wisconsin. I mean, right on down the road, and, and then you play that thing off. So, 
I don't think we're there. I don't think we're close to being there right now. But I do think you ask what would be one of the leverage pieces. I think that would be one of them. So, guys, we were up against yet another break. And when we come back, we are going to continue to dive into the SEC with Chris Lowe from ESPN. That's on the other side of the break. You're listening to the Stingray Show. We will be right back. Great All stuff. Right. So that was that was one segment, Chris. Do you have another about another ten minutes? Yeah, I could do it for ten more minutes. Okay. All right. Cool. And and then we'll let you get out of here. Okay. That sounds All good. Right. Your life can change on a dime, and if you are relocating for your job up to the rocket city of Huntsville, the fastest growing city in the state of Alabama, you need to contact Celeste Tegler of First Class Real Estate South Home Group. She has brokers all over North Alabama to help you get settled with buying a new home in North Alabama. You can contact her at 205-861-5698. Once again, that is Celeste Tegler, 205-861-5698. 5698. Contact Celeste Hagler today to live where you love in the state of Alabama, even in the rocket city of Huntsville. Welcome back inside the Sting Ray Show. Our guest this evening is Chris Lowe, senior writer for ESPN and reporter as well. And Chris, I do want to ask you your thoughts on this. In 2023, Vanderbilt ended the season at 2 and 10, 0 and 8 in the SEC. Now they're sitting there with a record of 4 and 2 and potentially could be 5 and 2 after this upcoming weekend against Ball State. Chris, your thoughts on the incredible turnaround of Clark Lee and Vanderbilt going from 2 and 10 last year to 4 and 2 right now. Number one, I'd say it's a probably an example of of a coach believing in his decision making and what's best for his program, you know, because you go back and look at this off season, Clark made uh, a ton of changes, really overhauled the program, you know, strength, the strength conditioning program, I think nutrition. He brought in uh, a new OC to call plays. Uh, he went back to calling his own plays on defense. Uh, he brings in Jerry Kill as a consultant. Jerry has a lot, a lot of experience in college football. I mean, he's been at New Mexico State. Had been at some places where they didn't have the most resources, and probably most importantly, they brought in a quarterback you know, with Jerry Diego Pavia, who's been lights out and has been that kind of quarterback that is just a difference maker on the field. His leadership, his ability to run the football, his toughness, uh, converting on third down, making big plays. Uh, so they, there's, there's just a, it's a different team than it was last year. I know coaches say that every year. Hey, every team's different. Well, this is a different team. It's a different program, a different look, a different mindset. And this team is playing with a lot of confidence, a ton of confidence. And even the games they've lost. The Georgia State was a was a bad loss. And that, that's not a game that Vandy should lose ever, okay? Uh, that's a bad loss. But even that loss was close. Missouri's an overtime loss. They have every chance to win that game. So when you watch Vanderbilt play, and I think this is the most – important thing to me is having watched them now a couple times is they're a really sound football team, a well-coached football team. Uh, they play the entire game. You don't see a lot of lulls. And I think that's that's the thing that I admire the most about watching these guys play this year and watching the way Clark and his staff coach them is they're a tough out, and they're not going to give you a whole lot. you got to beat them. And I think as we go forward – I don't think they're good enough to be a playoff team, and maybe I'll eat my words. And for Vanderbilt's sake, I hope I do. But I do think they're going to be a factor in this league and who does make the playoff. Chris, one thing I was going to ask you is what team you think can surprise us the second half of the season, not named Vanderbilt? I'm just going to throw out the bottom five teams for you. You can pick one or two or how many you want. But the bottom five currently in the SEC, Florida, South Carolina, Kentucky, Auburn, and Mississippi State. Do any of these guys get off the mat and make a run this year? I think Arkansas, and I'm going to cheat a little bit, I think Arkansas is one of those teams that could. 
And I think South Carolina, too, is another team that, you know, they just haven't, you know, Ole Miss game beat them pretty soundly at home. I know that, that Shane Bean was not a happy camper about that game. But, gosh, you look at the Bama game last week, you look at the LSU game a few weeks ago, um, if they can just play a little cleaner, you know, and not hurt themselves with penalties, you know, some critical turnovers. But their defensive front is good enough to keep them in every game they play. They, they've got three or four guys up front there, pass rushers in the middle. I'm talking about guys like Kennard and Sanders, you know, the freshman, Miller you know, Stewart, that, that they're going to give everybody a play fit. So they've got some big games coming up with some key teams. I think South Carolina is a, is a team to watch in the second half of the season if they can clean it up across the board and play cleaner football. Okay. So, Chris, I've got three questions left for you. The first one, going into week number eight, if you had to give the Coach of the Year trophy out right now, who do you feel like deserves it the most? Are we talking uh, Stingray Ray Nashley or an SEC? Uh, SEC, sorry, SEC. I think Clark Lee. I don't think there's any question. He's a runaway winner. Now, you know, you don't win races at the 50 meter mark, 100, yeah. 100 meter races. We'll see if they can finish. And that's been a problem for Vanderbilt over the years, to be fair. And if we want to look at the whole picture, sometimes they struggled in the latter games because of depth and, and they just don't have some of the personnel that some of the other teams are playing, you know, and that, that starts to take its toll as you get into games 9, 10, 11, 12. So we'll see if they can finish this season. But, I mean, what they've done to this point and the way they've played and who they've beaten, um, how competitive they've been, and when you figure they were the clear choice to be the, the last team in the league, you know, everybody, coaches, media picked them. Although I think there were two people, now that you say that, weren't there two people at the media days who picked them to win the league? They did, yes. Uh huh, yes. So maybe, hey, maybe those people knew a lot more than we did. Maybe, maybe everybody was sort of ridiculing them back in, in July. Maybe they knew something, but, uh, they still were the, the runaway pick to, to be a la- the last place team in the league. And they've been anything but the worst team in this league. I mean, they're, they're solidly in the top half to me to this point, or right there, you know, in the top half. So I think Clark's uh, is the midseason coach of the year. I really do. I think he's been that good. His team's been that good, and um, I think the people who who coached with him over the years would tell you that he's always been a good football coach. So Chris, when we turn the page to week number eight this weekend, there are some huge matchups in the SEC. The first one I want to talk with you about is where College Game Day is going to be. Austin, Texas, between the Georgia Bulldogs and the Texas Longhorns. Chris, if you would break that game down for us there in Austin. I think it's it's really can Georgia play better against the pass and play better in the secondary, not let Quinn Ewers just you know pick them apart. That's that's a big concern right now for Georgia. You know, they've got a couple halves, first half against. Um, Alabama, and then, of course, the last game against Mississippi State, where they just they haven't played great in the secondary. And, 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 of course, that goes – that's always not just one position that's been able to, to impact or affect the quarterback and that kind of thing. So that's – you know, we know Ewers and, and that, that offense at Texas can score points and can do so quickly. That matchup is key in this game. Uh, and that can Georgia run the ball. That, that's the other thing. Georgia needs to play better. In the run game, again, up front offensively, you know, making some chunk plays in the run game, not being behind the sticks, you know, where Carson Beck's having to throw the ball, you know, 40-plus times a game. Uh, but there's a lot of pride in that Georgia program, and you saw that in the second half against uh, Alabama, the way they got up off the deck and came back. They have not played their best football, but I think, if you again, if you follow Kirby Smart's career there and what he's done with that program, and these almost – Always in these types of games, uh, they rise to the occasion. I think they were unbeaten in top five matchups going into the Alabama game under Kirby Smart, and you know. So here's another one, and it's um, and it's on the road. Texas has got a lot of momentum. I think they're probably the most talented team in the SEC. Georgia would probably be close, 
but this just, to me, smells like one of those games where Georgia goes in and plays its best game and finds a way to win. So, Chris, my final question for you. This weekend, there is a huge rivalry as Alabama returns to Neyland Stadium, where the last time when they walked in, they got beat by Tennessee. Now both teams have one loss coming into the third Saturday in October. Chris, if you would break down this game for us and how you see this edition of the third Saturday in October going there on Rocky Top. Neither team's played um, great football. I mean, they've been pretty good in stretches. Um, Tennessee has not played a very difficult schedule at this point. They just haven't. You know, Florida gave them all they wanted last week. We know Florida struggled. Uh, Alabama, with that win over Georgia, I think has been probably tested a little bit more. You know, we know South Carolina defensively in their line is really good. And so I think Alabama is, is the more tested of the two. The game's in Knoxville, which favors Tennessee. Uh, Tennessee, I think, has a lot better football in front of it. And this, to me, is the week that they start to put it together on offense against an Alabama team that's, let's be honest, they've been shaky for the last two weeks. And I think Tennessee does find some answers on offense against an Alabama defense that has given up some big plays and not been at its best. So I think this is one of those games, not 50-something to 40-something like it was two years ago, but I think this is a game that we used to see a little bit more on offense because Milrow is so explosive. I think Tennessee will find a way to get it done and win this game, which, again, puts Bama in a tough situation, but I certainly don't think that means Tennessee is home free for the playoff because they still got to play, as I said, at Vandy and at Georgia. So, Chris, as always, thank you for taking time out of your schedule to join us, and feel free to plug any article that you guys have got coming up that you would like to promote. Well, as I said, I'm going to do something this week on sort of Tennessee having a lead on defense, which is not probably what a lot of people expected. I don't know Mark Slayball has a has a piece coming up on Ryan Williams. He's been, if not the best freshman in college football, he's certainly been right up there in the top two or three. Yes. So, Chris, enjoy covering the Alabama-Tennessee game this weekend, and we will definitely catch up with you later on this season, okay? Okay. Good to be with you guys. Take care. Thank you. All right. Chris, Bye-bye. thank you so much. Have a good week. Okay. See you guys. So, Heath, that is going to wrap up our interview there with Chris Lowe. We really do, once again, want to thank him for joining us. And, guys, when we come back, we've got one segment left here on the Stingray Show. And on Thursday evening, the Saints are at home versus the Broncos. Ross Jackson of the Locked On Podcast will join us next to talk all things who that and the saints we will be right back to finish up the stingray show